lens of the needs of um, veterans in our community. And I loved the fact that the Veterans Association wanted to do this panel because I think that really, um, if you name any area of law, there's a need among veterans for services in those areas. And we have a really robust panel here today to talk about many different um, modes of practice and ways people can get involved working with veterans, as well as then how you can gain transferable skills working with veterans to work in many different practice areas. Um, so I'm going to do a short little intro of who we're going to, um, who's going to speak today. I could either introduce each person as they talk or do a run through of the whole panel. Does the panel have a preference? Should I just, how about I like, introduce people and then you talk? That? Okay, so starting up with Professor Dan DeVoy, um, who uh, directs our Veterans Legal Advocacy Center here at GGU and has a long history of performing legal work on behalf of military veterans, as well as being um, a veteran himself. Thank you. Um, so we run, or I run, help run the center. Um, what we do, if you can speak closer to it. Pull it closer to it. Better. Uh, um, what we do basically is we help remove obstacles of uh, veterans that are blocking their success as they transition into the uh, civilian world. We do that right now by two forms. Uh, one is we help them gain monetary compensation from the VA, uh, monetary compensation in the form of injuries they incurred in service that are still aggravating them now. A veteran can receive compensation for that. The second area we help is to dis discharge upgrades. Uh, many veterans receive the less than desirable discharge. To do this, they can't access some of those same benefits I just discussed. Uh, so we help them change that. Um, and that is our main mission. Some of the skills we learn, uh, client interviews, brief writing, evidence analysis, uh, these are all things that are transferable to any position, but specifically any type of junior attorney position, which is uh, what you'll all be gunning for shortly. Uh, the application process is pretty straightforward. Uh, it's online on the Twin site. It's also found on the course website. Um, it includes a basic resume, personal statement about yourself. It's pretty straightforward. So thank you very much. Look forward to today. Um, and our, let me grab this again. Our next speaker is Moe Sior, who's an staff attorney and pro bono fellow with Swords to Plowshares. And uh, Mo, before coming to Plowshares, worked with DNA People's Legal Services, providing legal assistance to victims of domestic violence on the Navajo Nation. And um, also did a variety of different experiential learning opportunities during law school and graduated from Boston, Boston College Law School. Thanks. Um, Thanks everyone for coming and expressing an interest in working with veterans. Um, as she mentioned, I work at Swords to Plowshares. We're a nonprofit organization um, located in Soma, just down on Howard. Uh, we were founded in 1974 by returning Vietnam era veterans. Um, and the purpose of the organization, or the mission, is to meet the needs of veterans who are coming back from Vietnam <coughs> and since then, obviously, the other um, wars that are uh, marginalized or vulnerable, uh, primarily homeless veterans, low-income veterans, and those who have uh, what's what we refer to as bad papers, uh, which Dan mentioned briefly, the veterans who come back with discharge statuses that preclude them from accessing VA benefits. Um, so helping them, very similarly, um, upgrading those discharge statuses so that they are eligible um, for VA <coughs> benefits, and also helping them obtain VA benefits, mostly through service-connected compensation claims and non-service-connected pension claims. Um, so there are eight attorneys working in the legal unit at SWORDS. We're a um, holistic, uh, we have a holistic approach to veteran needs. So we have a legal unit um, where we do the VA benefits and discharge upgrade work, but there's also a housing unit. We have different housing um, projects across the Bay Area. Um, we have social workers on staff, money management, uh, an employment and training office that just opened up in Oakland. Um, so working at SWORDS is great as an attorney because you can sort of touch on all these different resources within one organization. So if I have a client that comes to me who's homeless, I can refer them to a housing program that then can help them get housed. Um, you know, if they need a fiduciary, we have the money management program I can refer them to. So it's, it's kind of a holistic approach that we have um, that we take advantage of. Um, in addition to working with 
clients directly. We do assisted pro se work and to full scope representation with VA claims um, and discharge cases. Um, we also have a robust pro bono program where we work with attorneys here in the Bay Area, uh, private attorneys who um, volunteer and take on cases with us. And we run legal clinics, um, both at the hospital here in San Francisco, there's also a downtown clinic, and then some in the South Bay. Um, so we run legal clinics out of the VA medical centers and doing work um, on those two areas of law and reaching clients where they're already at. Um, and we have GGU students actually um, currently volunteering with us at that downtown clinic, um, which they've been a great help. Um, Byron in the back there is one of our volunteers who's helped with us a lot. <coughs> so in terms of our um, student internship opportunities, um, we have a summer internship program. Um, we're, we already have our interns um, for 2015. Um, one of them is here today. And, uh, but we accept applications on a rolling basis for next summer and then during the school year, depending on um, our availability as staff attorneys to supervise, because that's important to us. We want you to have a great experience working with us. Um, so we want to make sure we can you know, devote our attention to you guys. So depending on our ability to bring in interns during the school year, that's another opportunity. Um, and then we also have postgraduate fellowships, like um, Equal Justice Works fellowships and Scattered fellowships that we take on. Um, so if you're interested in either of those, I have flyers here about how to get involved and in what the application process is. Um, to give you a, a kind of a brief snapshot of what a legal intern would do with the SWORDS um, office or in our legal unit, um, you'd work directly with an attorney on cases where they're representing a client either in their VA benefits claim or their discharge upgrade case. Um, it often involves writing briefs, doing research, um, a records review. We do a lot of me military and medical records reviews. Um, attending hearings at the VA regional office in Oakland. Um, and then also we have intake twice a week in our offices and intakes constantly at our clinics. Um, so doing intake interviews and developing your client counseling and interviewing skills. Um, and then also we have research projects. In addition to the legal unit, we have a policy department um, that works on national level policy work uh, around veterans and, and bad paper uh, issues and things like that. Um, so there's also opportunities to do policy research alongside working, you know, direct legal services. Um, so like I said, I have flyers up here that kind of go into depth. Um, the application process for both the summer internship and during the school year is pretty straightforward. Uh, just a cover letter, resume, writing, sample, and references. Um, and the attorney to address those all to is a woman named Becca Van Buren. She was supposed to be here today, but she's that sick. But she's our kind of attorney who's our point person for all our, our law student internship and fellowship work. Um, so yeah, thanks. Um, so our next speaker is uh, Nick Shum from One Justice, who's an Equal Justice Works AmeriCorps Legal Fellow and Veterans Legal Work. Did I say that correctly? Yeah. I was trying to think of maybe we can make it longer, maybe yeah. short. Like, is there supposed to be a comment there? And I don't think I know. No. But <laughs> I'm joking because I have the pleasure of working quite a bit with Renee, who also spearheads for One Justice. Uh, our justice bus trips. And we have an amazing opportunity coming up on April 11th, which you can talk about, it might be full, I don't know, working with veterans, doing expungement work. Um, but before coming to One Justice, Renee did a variety of work doing on counterterrorism, human rights, um, and veterans matters, and has done really a wide range of legal service work as well as policy work over the years. And it's a real pleasure to work with her on the veterans um, on the justice bus trips for our students. She has a JD from Michigan Law School. Hey, you guys, <laughs> can you hear me? Um, first of all, it is such an honor to be here speaking with GG Law students today. You all just are superlative in the amount of pro bono and righteous legal work that you do. I'm constantly impressed. Uh, one example of that is that, as Cynthia mentioned, we have a justice bus trip coming up to serve veterans down at the Fresno Vet Center on April 11th. Not only is that trip full, there were 10 spots. There are eight people on the wait list for the trip, which is just unprecedented. Um, we do trips with a number of wonderful law schools in the area, but I have to say those numbers are really amazing. Um, before I talk more about our veterans' work, um, I want to just give you a little bit of background on the Justice Bus Project itself. Um, so, 
first of all, the Justice Bus Project started in 2007, and the concept of it developed based on kind of an analysis of the data of California residents who are low income or particularly vulnerable, such as veterans, folks who are seniors, or folks who are disabled, um, and an analysis of where the attorneys <coughs> geographically exist in this large state of ours um, who are able to serve those folks. So based on the last US Census data, there's about 38 million uh, residents in the state of California. And of those 38 million, over 8 million live at or below 125% of the federal poverty guidelines, making them eligible for free legal services. Just to give you an idea, 100% of the federal poverty guideline means that one individual in a household is living off of just over $11,000 in a year, or a household of four is living over just uh, living off of just over $24,000 in a year. Um, so that kind of gives you an example of the dire situation of the folks that we're looking at in terms of low-income uh, Californians. Um, so there's over 8 million of those folks in the state of California. And in addition to that, if we look at veterans, seniors, and folks who are disabled, there's over 12 to 13 million Californians who are eligible for and in need of free legal services um, to a large extent. Um, unfortunately, in the state, most legal services attorneys and most attorneys, generally speaking, are concentrated in urban centers. But in California, most of our more vulnerable populations actually live in rural areas, like the Central Valley or the far reaches of Northern California. Um, so the point of the Justice Bus Project was to bridge what we call this justice gap between urban and rural California by taking on buses law students and attorneys from the Bay Area and from Los Angeles. I have a counterpart, an attorney in LA, who does the SoCal Justice Bus. Um, taking those folks, folks like you, out on a bus to rural communities for one or two days to provide free legal services through limited scope legal clinics on a wide range of what we call wraparound civil legal services. So when you hear about the legal issues that veterans are facing, you've heard from Professor DeVoy and from Mo at SWORDS about some of the veteran-specific legal work that, um, that folks do. We focus on solely kind of wraparound civil legal services such as expungement for veterans who need uh, criminal records expunged so that they can more easily um, get jobs, for example. Um, estate planning for veterans, so helping folks with simple wills, advanced health care directives, and power of attorney. Um, consumer debt issues for folks who are being targeted by debt collectors. Um, Housing issues for folks who are living in housing that's substandard, for example, or who are dealing with uh, landlord-tenant disputes. Um, and some other kind of civil legal issues that we're able to address within a limited scope setting for veterans. Um, so the Justice Bus Project takes folks, like I said, from urban areas out to rural communities. And as I already talked about, we have this wonderful opportunity to head to Fresno to work with the Fresno Vet Center to work um, supporting folks who need criminal record expungement down there. In addition to the Justice Bus Project, I recently started up with Legal Aid Society Employment Law Center and folks at Central California Legal Services, a monthly legal clinic for veterans. We're rotating the issue areas down there, focusing <coughs> so far on estate planning and now opening it up to expungement and housing, and hopefully soon consumer debt as well. Oh, and also workers' rights issues. Um, so, um, that's an example of the Justice Bus, which is a great opportunity for GG law students to get involved in really brief pro bono opportunities serving veterans in rural communities. Um, we also do have a project called the Law Student Pro Bono Project. Um, many of you may already be on that listserv. We send out a weekly newsletter via email that has information about a wide range of different internship and pro bono volunteer opportunities for GGU law students. Um, some of those opportunities involve veterans work. Um, and if you're not on that list and you'd like to be, please feel free to come up here and let me know and I'll sign you up for it today. Um, and I'll get you guys some flyers that we have about those opportunities as well. Um, so I guess I'll just finish by saying I think a lot of us, I have to say, whenever I um, speak with folks at Swords of Shares, for example, I'm always so envious because they're providing such incredible high quality services to veterans in urban areas. 
And I spend so much time working with veterans in rural communities that are so far from many of the resources <coughs> that they need. And I always just wish that there were stores that existed in every community in rural California. Too. Um, so please let me know if you have any more questions after the fact. Um, I'm also happy to speak with you about um, internships or pro bono volunteer opportunities outside of One Justice. Um, and yeah, thanks so much again to all of you for taking the time to come up here today. And our next speaker is uh, Ronald Perez. Uh, Ronald Perez is a, is a veteran, a Vietnam veteran, who then went on to work with the San Francisco Sheriff's Department's Rehabilitation Department <coughs> um, for, it looks like, 30 years? Longer than you've been born, I know. <laughs> <laughs> don't know how I wish. <laughs> and now works with, um, and now works with the Sheriff's Department's incarcerated veterans program called Cover, a community of veterans engaged in restoration, which provides really holistic case management services to veterans in the San Francisco jails and transition accounts. Start with I prefer being called Ron. Usually when I call Ronald, I'm in some kind of trouble. <laughs> uh, I, yes, I started in the Sheriff's Department in 1975, and actually in 1975 became connected with Swords to Plowshares and had a long history with Swords to Plowshares. I was on their board of directors for quite some time. Um, Swords to Plowshares started, the unique thing about Swords to Plowshares, it started in San Francisco State with a small group of Vietnam veterans and other veterans approximately five or six of them. They started out as a, uh, one of the very first so-called rap groups, and they uh, started under the heading of twice-born men, because if you survived Vietnam when you came back, you had that opportunity to be born again. And uh, those individuals took that <coughs> opportunity to be born again and created sorts of plowshares, which is one of the most premier and recognized uh, veteran service organizations in the United States as a very proud of sorts. And I'd also like to thank uh, Professor DeVoy for connecting with the cover program, Byron, as well as several other uh, individuals from the Golden Gate University that are coming out and <coughs> legal services for our veterans at the jail. And as a matter of fact, one of your fellow students is locked in my office, attached to the desk doing uh, uh, data. Serious. <laughs> yes. She's entering all the data on our veterans in our database. Um, cover program started approximately five years ago. Um, I have been for many, many years saying that there's a significant population of veterans in the county jail. Uh, they kept saying, no, there's not. I kept saying, yes, there is. And they kept trying to include veterans at, and as a category to be recognized. And everything that we did, including intake forms, everything, people would say, what's what's so important about a veteran? Because when Vietnam veterans came back and got involved in the criminal justice system, we were not able to access any services to the VA. VA said, we'll take care of them when they get out of jail. Community-based organizations would say, oh, you're a veteran. The VA should take care of you. They should be providing services for you. So, um, and the veterans, did not want to have anything to do with the Veterans Administration for a wide variety of reasons. And when they did have that paper, which meant they were ineligible for anything, but telling the community that was very, very difficult. Um, approximately now, yeah, I guess about eight, nine years, eight years ago, I was retiring from the Sheriff's Department, then got a call and said, we're going to do that veterans program we wanted to start started. This time around, though, it was much different than what uh, we've experienced in the past working with veterans. We had the VA take, and the VA recognized the errors that they made with the Vietnam veterans by denying their services and having legal difficulties. One thing to keep in mind, <coughs> the majority of the veterans <coughs> never had any criminal history until after serving after going into a combat situation. And that's why I feel that it's very important that yes, veterans should be dealt with differently than the regular population because what 
what they've gone through and the things that they're continually going through. Because if you're a combat veteran, the combat never ends. It's with you for life. No matter what you do, you can never get rid of it. Um, so um, they decided to start a veterans program. We had a number of uh, partnerships. We have everybody um, in terms of community support for the Salvation Army. Walden House, which is now Health Right 360, and has also encompassed a number of uh, other programs, including the Haight-Ashbury Street Clinic. And I used to be a volunteer with Rock Medicine, take care of all the folks that were a little bit too inebriated at the shows. Um, so we had no, and uh, collectively started providing services for the veterans. What the sheriff did was uh, every veteran that comes into our system asked the question when at booking and he's in a position to answer appropriately. <coughs> the question is, have you military experience or have you served in the military? They say yes, they're identified as veteran <coughs> and they're sent to the COVER program. Again, COVER stands for Community of Veterans Engaged in Restoration. We're trying to restore the veterans and get them back to the community. Um, once they're identified as a veteran, they come to the COVER program an intake is done by the Sheriff's Department staff and the EA staff also come in and they do their intakes and determine what their eligibility is. Obviously, if they've got good paper, then they're eligible for full services. If they have <coughs> less than an honorable discharge, <coughs> there's no service for them in terms of starting to access or try to get that discharge changed while incarcerated now that we have uh, Professor Du Bois and students from Golden Gate University, at least that process can get started there and also have a system where when they get out, they can continue and come down here and do the follow-up. So we're extremely happy about that. Um, another thing that's occurred since the development of COVID was recognized that yes, there is a significant number of veterans in there and why do they have a special court for them? Because there are already courts for domestic violence, there's drug court, there's diversionary courts, but there was no diversionary court for veterans at the time. So since then, there, uh, San Francisco Veterans Court started with a small population. Uh, they were the community justice courts on Polk Street, and they started with just misdemeanors. The requirement was you had to be arrested in the Tenderloin or live in the Tenderloin, and it was a misdemeanor for you to participate in veterans court. It was so successful that recently, earlier this year, it was expanded um, to its own standard court. It is now located at 850 Bryant Street at the Hall of Justice with all of the other courts. And it meets at least twice a week. It meets on Tuesdays and Fridays. Friday is its primary court date that they have most of their veterans come in. But the wonderful thing about veterans court is, again, they get the wraparound services. And it doesn't matter what type of discharge they had, they are still able to access Veterans Court and get uh, services, which include being placed in treatment, getting housing, assistance with employment, <coughs> et cetera. It's been very, very successful, so successful that now the population of veterans in the jail has gone down. When cover started, we had the cover pod was full to the max with 48 veterans in it. This morning when I left, we had 20 veterans in the pod. There's approximately 45 to 60 veterans actively involved in the veterans court. And uh, so again, it's very, very successful. My involvement in the veterans court is connected to, obviously with the cover program, but I'm also a mentor. We have a mentor program for the veterans court, and we're looking for more mentors because right now there's just two of us. So anyone who's interested, being a mentor in the Veterans Court. I would love to talk to you about that and invite you to come visit the Veterans Court. Um, it meets, it, even if you're not interested in being a mentor but want to see how Veterans Court operates, uh, it's an operation Friday afternoons at, from 2 o'clock to approximately 4 p.m. in the afternoon. Uh, if you're interested in volunteering with the cover program, the things that Cover that I'm looking for individuals that are interested in learning about criminal justice system, learning about what's available in the 
community in terms of treatment, et cetera, and um, basic casework and case management. Um, it's a one, if you're very, if you're extremely interested in the criminal justice system, working in the jails is the best place to learn about it. And um, at this point, I'm going to stop because I want to turn it over to Nick because um, our services sometimes go hand in hand. And again, thank you for the opportunity to be here, and thank you for allowing me to present. All right. Uh, next speaker is Nick Figueritos, um, who's with Prisoner Legal Services, which has taken many GGU students as externs over the summers, over the years, um, as a great partner for our students, and provides a wide range of legal services and advocacy to people inside the San Francisco jail system. Um, Greg Ross. Okay. Hi, I'm, I'm Nick Greg Ross. I, uh, I'm the director of Prisoner Legal Services. Uh, Prisoner Legal Services actually was started in 1974 by um, our past sheriff, Mike Hennessy, as a, he wanted to be a public interest lawyer. Started on a vista grant, I think he made about a hundred, lived off food stamps and about $200 a month. Um, eventually, when he became sheriff, he decided to bring in, make it part of the sheriff's department because he didn't want it to fall apart. So it's been going now four years. Wow. Um, I am also an ex-offender um, who took advantage of prisoner legal services back in the late eighties when I was in jail um, myself. Um, so when I went to Public Interest Day and I saw them there, I was like, "Hey, are you the same people that helped me out?" And it turned out they work, and I ended up with a job interview, got a job, and. Um, so it's a cool job. Um, we deal with, like everybody else talking about, marginalized populations. We deal with people who can't deal with things on their own, which is the main reason they're in jail. Most of them are there with mental health issues, they have substance abuse issues, they grew up in poverty, they just, you know, they, you know, I know people with the same things don't make it in jail, but this group ended up in jail. And they need a lot of help. They need a lot of help, but they were just on the street. Um, so we're really starting below square one um, with them. Um, we, you know, we like to say we deal with removing barriers to re-entry. People have warrants, but they want to go to the program, so we try to get rid of the warrant. Um, they might get our holes out of other counties. We deal with, um, you know, they, have a, they try to clean up their driver's licenses. We deal with tickets. Um, they want to get power of attorney so they can get money from one place and put it in another. They want to keep their apartment. We want to get power of attorney. Um, you name it, we do it. We also run law libraries um, where they can find out about their, you know, their criminal case. I'm here for a burglary. What's a burglary? Well, you know, all I did was, or what's a robbery? All I did was grab, or push her down, grab the person, and run. Well, if you have a criminal law, you know that's actually a robbery. It's not just a person engine. So we go through the elements of a crime and explain what the DA needs to prove. And of course, everyone says that's not what happened. We're not saying we're not telling, saying you did it. We're just saying this is what they need to prove. So we we educate them on the law. Um, what else? It's a, it's a really cool place to work. It is a, which they are still trying to tell me after 17 years of being there, trying to try home to me that it's a paramilitary organization, and being a veteran of a colonel in the army for my whole first 18 years of my life. I am very contemptuous to that kind of stuff, so I have a lot of problems there for that reason. But I, um, it is kind of a cool place to work. You're paid by the sheriff to mess with the sheriff. So it's kind of a, you know, and, and it gets frustrating. And it was funny because I was read in our, I read something, one of our interns a couple years ago for our past sheriff, Mike Hennessy, who just left, he wrote a history of prisoner legal services and interviewed every single um, director going back to the start, including uh, Mike Hennessy, and then wrote a really, it's like, you know, maybe 25 page history. It's really great. And I just, someone wanted to see it, so I was looking through it and I found a quote that said, if the direct, I just found this last night, and I was feeling really down, like, you know, these people don't want to change, it's a horrible job, I just need to quit, I need to go somewhere else. And he said, if the woman had written, was I mean hers? She wrote, if you, if the director is not frustrated and conflicted about the job at all times, he or she is not doing the job correctly. So I was like, gee, thanks, wish they had told me that 17 years ago. <laughs> um, but it's a great job, because, you know, you're, doing, you're, you're, you're there to change people's minds, to change people's attitudes. And to help people, and that's those are the you know the, the three hardest things to do, and that's kind of what I got into this work for to help people. And 
unfortunately it's not. You can't just help one person if you can't change someone else's mind to get them to help. So and that's kind of what, it, I mean, if you're going to go into criminal defense, your job is going to be to change the district attorney's mind. If, you know, that's what you're going to do. Um, you learn a lot, do, working with us, you do a lot of interviewing of clients, a lot of con um, client control, you learn a lot of that. One of the um, things I was told when I first became an attorney, I'd been an intern down there right around the Hall of Justice for two, two years, and I finally passed the bar, and I was all excited. There was this one, one criminal defense attorney who everyone, he's well respected, and, there was, and I, I told, I, I walked in, I told the clerk, hey, I passed the bar, and she said, great. Question for you, who runs the courtroom? Judge, she said, no. I said, the bailiffs? She's looking at me and she goes, one more guess. And I said, the clerks? And she said, yes, don't forget that. <laughs> and she said, if you, if you get along with the clerks, your case is called first, you get everything you want. So I always say good morning to the clerks. And then the attorney goes next to me, he goes, she's telling you the truth. She goes, he goes, he goes you, you get to know the clerks, you handle your clients, client control, you can deal with the DAs, you can tolerate the DAs, and you can, you're, you're polite to the deputies. You don't even need to know the law. That's like, oh, great. Oh, but it really is. It really comes down to client control and dealing with people. And you're dealing with people that other people don't want to help and don't, and don't, and don't care about. Or just, not they don't care about them, but I mean, I'm sure you've done this. You know, you walk down the street, someone's asking for money, and you give them money someday. And other times, you just look straight, you, you look right through them because for whatever reason, you don't want to look at them. I, I, I do it all the time. It's like I just don't have time and it's sad. But that's what these people are like. People look right through them, they're not there. So um, that's what we're there to help. Um, what else? Um, we do run a great internship program every summer. Um, I actually have room for one, maybe two more. It depends. Um, I have to figure out who's going to be there this summer already, but I might have a little more room. I have a um, flyer here if you're interested. Um, what else can I tell you about this? Um, a lot of people that want to go into criminal justice come into our come here and then go move on to the public defenders. The public defenders loves our interns because they know they know their way around the jail, they know they can deal with deputies, and they know that they have client control. Um, what, what else, what else? Um, we, one of the things we're lacking is I am the only attorney there. I don't know a lot about veterans issues, which is great, we have Dan there now. Um, I mean, I can refer people, um, I try to get people. A couple years ago we had, a, which was, was the last summer, Awesome. We had a guy from the BAP program at Bolt, and he was all about veterans issues. He was down there, I'm going to do this for this guy. I'm like, what is that? And he would explain it to me. I said, all right, do you have anybody, any other attorneys that can help you make sure you do this right? He, said, he had people from the school, so it was great. So if there's any veterans out here that are more interested in doing that, or anybody wants to do that, that can also help us get a little support from Dan or somebody else, because it's just one area of law I don't know a lot about, but I'm willing to learn. Um, we'd love to have you. Um, I guess that's it. You can just ask me questions afterwards. So thank you. Um, I want to open up for more questions from folks. I have questions. Okay, yeah, I'm going to ask a question. <laughs> so I'm wondering, for folks who might want to work with veterans, um, long into the future. I'm wondering if there are areas where you see that there are openings for new attorneys. Maybe populations of veterans that are yet to be served. Maybe areas of law where there's particular need among veterans that isn't being met. Um, I can think of one of those at the top of my head. But anyway, I'm wondering if, if there, how you would advise someone who wants to really build a practice around working with veterans on what areas of law might be available or client populations might be really right for I'd say uh, one area I've encountered uh, that we don't exist in right now, but we encounter a lot, uh, surprisingly they go, seem to go hand in hand sometimes, is family law and expungements. Uh, those are areas where veterans need a lot of help, so if you are interested in those areas, uh, you will need a significant amount of veterans. That's what I was going to say. Okay, I'm going to chime in and add another one, which is um, services to people in prison, specifically as opposed to jail. Um, and I know, um, being a prison lawyer myself, that the veteran population inside our state prisons for people doing time for very serious crimes has really skyrocketed. Um, and inside the prison environment, folks face 
some very special challenges, I think, as veterans. And in particular, there's been a shift in uh, mental health uh, service delivery in California State Prison where they've eliminated talk therapy and moved to medication-based therapy only. And for folks who suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder, that's torturous, frankly, to people. Um, and so there's people suffering greatly in the prison system and really a complete lack of attorneys looking in that area. Um, so if anyone's interested in that, that's one that I happen to be aware of. But I feel like there's pockets that come up in almost every practice area, um, as I said at the very beginning, with serving veterans. Um, and address a little yeah. bit. Um, one of the things that we're working on at SWORTS is reaching out to the um, female veteran population. Um, so not a different practice area necessarily, but um, you know the female veteran population is growing. Um, we're reaching them through our doors, but we're trying to like find areas or, or areas in the community or different resources in the community where we can get in touch with that population because. Um, primarily, we see male veterans. Um, so that's just another area. And, and also, um, the sort of epidemic of military sexual trauma that affects both um, male and female veterans, um, and sort of addressing that issue um, through VA compensation claims, um, just through our work. But it's just an area that's sort of growing and, and something we're trying to deal with. So I, I know um, mental health and substance abuse issues are very common amongst veterans and often a combination of the two. And I'm wondering if you help, um, if, from any of you, if you help them seek treatment from the VA or, or and if not, how do you um, circumvent the lack of other public resources that are available? So I can, I can kind of address that. Um, a lot of the service-connected compensation issues that we deal with um, are trying to get veterans compensation for mental health conditions that stem from um, or arose while they were in service. Um, and this isn't necessarily, we don't address, like we don't provide treatment necessarily for those conditions, um, but we provide assistance or getting them compensation for conditions that disable them as a result of their military service. So the, the most um, prevalent would be PTSD. Um, so you have some sort of trauma or vented stressor, and you have PTSD today as a result, and that prevents you from maintaining employment um, or disables you somewhat um, and, and prevents you from, from having a job. So we help in that regard. Um, and we also, as part of that, you need a current diagnosis for your mental health condition in order to get compensation. Um, so we often have to advise clients who are not currently diagnosed or getting treatment, but who are experiencing symptoms of mental health um, conditions to seek treatment with the VA. Um, and if they don't have treatment, or if they're not eligible for VA health care because of their bad papers, for example, or their um, barriers to getting into the VA store, um, then yeah, just, in, just trying to put them in touch with other resources in the community. Um, we have a relationship with Alliant University, which is a, a university in the East Bay that um, their um, psychology department works with us in getting veterans care and, and evaluations for their claims. Um, so yeah, sort of. Uh, for our population in, in the jail, um, the Veterans Administration also has what's called Veterans Justice Officers. And so they come and work directly with our incarcerated veterans, those that are eligible for full services and they will connect them with services uh, and get them placed in treatment. And uh, for those that aren't eligible for the VA services, our staff takes care of them and gets them placed in community settings. Uh, we utilize, as I said before, we have Health Right 360 there uh, in the facility so they can come in and do screening of the individual and connect them with services through Health Right 360, not necessarily just Walden House with Asian American and all the other so for many veterans, sometimes becoming incarcerated helps them access treatment much quicker than through the outside, which is sad to say, but sometimes that's the way it works. We also have the risk of jail behavior health. It's jail behavior health now. They change it from JPS to another and that acronym, acronym. But they are really good about getting people services, even if they don't qualify will find somewhere in the city, San Francisco, to get some help, so. And at the beginning of the cover program, actually, um, jail health services 
was very instrumental because they were one of the first grants to get cover started was with, with, in conjunction with mental health. So they had mental health staff assigned directly to the pod. That grant has run out. They're looking at trying to get additional funding, but we still are able to access their service for the mental health services for them. is going into the jails and talking to someone and realizing that it's not about the politics of the place I'm working. It's not about me, it's about them, and it's about helping them. And when I help them, I walk out feeling good. And that's really what inspires me. Or you're walking down the street and someone comes up to you and they remember you from jail and you're doing well, and you know, which is much better when you're not doing well and they're not committing crimes, you still your wallet. They actually come out and they and they thank you. They just come out and, you know, and all you really did was had a, a, a short conversation with them. Because a lot of these people, you know, I like to joke that part of our job is holding hands, but that really is what our job is. Is you know, you go to jail, you're, you know, you have no connection with the outside, and you're there to help somebody. And if you, if you can spend five minutes with someone in jail, that's five more minutes than anyone else has ever spent probably in a long time. So um, that that's what inspires me. Just continue to help people. For me, um, I started in 1975, and I was one of those, along with Sheriff Mike Hinkle, he wasn't sheriff at the time, but uh, we were connected with New College, New College Law School. I was in the humanities program. Um, I got $145 a month, 30 college credits, didn't get the food stamps. I don't know how Mike managed to get the food stamps. <laughs> uh, and it was a one-year commitment, and so in order to do that, I also had a part-time job and was also going to another school so I could get my VA benefits because New College didn't grant VA benefits and found ways to work to be able to work in the jail. And um, again, it was a one-year commitment and that was 1975. Here it's 2015 and I'm back in the jail. Um, I'm not the sheriff's department now, but I'm through sorts of plowshares ironically. Um, and for me, same as as uh, Nick has said, you know, you, be, you never know when it's going to happen. Somebody comes up to you, I mean, it have, happened quite often, they'll say, 15 years ago when I was in work furlough, you helped me get a job. Or, you know, uh, when I was in your pod, in county jail number three, you directed me to a treatment program, and I've been clean ever since. I mean, I had one individual who's a doctor now. I took him to the VA. Many years ago, he would call me, hey, I'm now on, you know, I'm, I'm a peer counselor at the VA. I'm now this, I'm now that. He's now a doctor. Uh, he's written many books. He's got his own treatment program. I mean, you never know who you're going to be able to touch. And that's, Nick has said that's the rewarding part is you have the opportunity to affect somebody's life for the positive. Your life may be shit, but somebody else's life. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was up in Butte and Shasta counties on Friday and Saturday for an overnight justice bus trip, and it was an incredible feeling um, to start the clinic. We opened the door. It was about 10 a.m., and there was literally a line of clients, many of whom were veterans, waiting for us just to open that door so they could rush in to get free services with their expungement of their criminal records. Um, and that was just an incredible feeling. Um, so I guess that's this kind of social justice, public interest oriented sentiment that I know a lot of you share that drives you. Um, and it never gets old. I guess I would say. For me, um, in terms of veteran work specifically, my father is a combat vet. He was drafted when he dropped out of San Jose State um, to Vietnam, and he lost his leg after seven months, and he wasn't aware of the VA benefits he was eligible for um, based on his injury and PTSD for 30 years after he returned. 
And so I think that has impacted my day-to-day -day life, and I recognize the lack of information and resources that so many veterans have. Um, so that has really spurred my interest in working with veterans, although I also work with a lot of other populations as well. Thanks for sharing that, Mary. Um, I think for me, I, um, I'm just motivated by working with people who are marginalized um, and vulnerable, people who, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of hot topic issues that, that um, we as public interest attorneys have the opportunity to go work for. Um, and for me, uh, veterans was never really on the table and I didn't know about working with veterans until I actually applied for this job. Um, and I guess uh, I've become passionate as a result of, of working with this population and seeing the sort of systemic issues. Um, for example, like what, what, what Ron mentioned earlier is, is folks not having a criminal record until after they came back from combat um, and recognizing that serving in the military can have sort of long-lasting mental health um, ramifications and lifelong ramifications um, and wanting to address that and wanting to assist people who have put their, line, their life on the line for our country, um, they deserve the best and they deserve our um, everything, every resource we can offer them. Um, so as an attorney, I, I guess I'm passionate about sort of fixing that, that's being part of the solution in that system that, that's flawed, um, where you serve in combat and you come back and there's, there's not enough for you, um, support-wise and resources-wise, so, so sort of being part of that solution. Um, and also, I, what, what we do at SWORDS, or what, we, what I focus on in the, in the legal unit, is getting folks service-connected compensation, as I mentioned. Um, and that's really just a cash benefit. Um, and it's a tax-free monthly benefit that, that veterans get. And I, I think, I don't know, for me, I have seen the result of getting um, low-income or homeless veterans cash can have this, like, it, it, it helps them in so many areas of life. It can help them with their housing. It can help them, you know, get off the streets. It can help them get off drugs. It can help them get off, um, you know, paying off child back child support that they, that's been bogging them down. Um, it sort of can fix other air legal problems that they're having, I guess, by, by just getting them cash in their pocket. And um, anyway, so that's one of the things that I enjoy is, um, you know, I'm not getting them an apartment, I'm not getting them like one discreet thing, I'm just giving them like the ability to have that freedom and that, um, yeah, freedom, I guess, more than anything. Um, so that, that's one of the reasons. I think for me, um, when I was first starting out, I remember I had a client come see me about a very, very serious issue. And I gave my advice, the client said okay, I thought, oh my God, they're actually gonna do it. Yeah. Uh, and that's an experience you'll all have when you're first starting out. Uh, because it's actually a great responsibility to be an attorney. And I believe you do have that responsibility to help out an underserved population. Uh, for me, that was a veteran's population because I am a veteran. And I know that from firsthand experience, uh, watching these veterans VA benefits was a life changing experience. Uh, it can really set a lot of great things in motion. Um, and you know, there are some days uh, where I'm just beat up and I feel I can't do anymore. Um, and what I'll do is I'll call a client and talk to them. And like Nick was saying, sometimes all you can do is hear their story. Um, but usually there's such great gratitude from the veteran population for anything you can do for them. Uh, it's very inspiring. But you think it's you know, we all have this vision, I mean, as I know it's better it's been mentioned it makes, we all just, in our minds, think people are in jail for a reason, they've done something horrible or whatever, and, and most of them, you know, people have broken the law, but most of them are really, they can be your next door neighbor, your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, they really are, when you start talking to them, they're just, they're just like us, and they're, they're they just really, they just get upon hard times, and that's why they're there. Uh, any last words of wisdom for students launching their careers? This isn't really as deep as that, so I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but I do, I should have mentioned earlier, as a member of the Veterans Legal Corps, I just want to make sure everyone's aware of it. So 
Um, my fellowship is a one-year fellowship. I've been renewed for a second year. It gets capped out at two years. It's my first job out of law school. And it's funded through AmeriCorps. So AmeriCorps, in conjunction with the private foundation, Equal Justice Works, funds, I don't know the exact number right now, but I think it's um, in the Veterans Legal Corps around 30 to 40 uh, recent law school graduates doing work with veterans. Um, and you should definitely look into that program. Um, it's a unique one in that basically host organizations or nonprofits that do work with veterans or want to expand to work with veterans apply through Equal Justice Works Foundation for the Veterans Legal Corps funding. They also fund other projects focused on issue area specific work. One area of of work right now is expungement work. So that's another area where you could get um, you know, a lot of work with veterans through that fellowship. But you'll see job advertisements coming up around May, June, maybe as late as July for those legal core fellowships through individual nonprofit organizations. If you're not a 3L and you're not job searching right now, I would also say if you want to go into public interest work, recognize um, that part of your job will be finding funding for yourself. Um, and consider seeking out a nonprofit organization and coming to them and letting them know about the Equal Justice Works AmeriCorps um, funding that's available for their nonprofit and ask them if they would like to apply for that funding so that you can, and then hopefully you could be the candidate that takes that position then. Um, that's different from the traditional Equal Justice Works fellowships, which you write a grant application for, which I'm sure Cynthia has spoken with you about or is happy to, and I also am. Um, and I would say for second years, first, first, first going into second year summers um, and moving forward, um, it really should be on your mind, thinking about how you might fund your perfect ideal job. And there's a series of these different American for opportunities, which again, the nonprofit applies for the money that which creates then the position. One is around veterans, another is around immigration. There's another one that's around civil rights, civil liberties. Um, we have two uh, recent grads who are AmeriCorps fellows at different places um, right now, one doing immigration work and one doing racial justice work. Um, and so it is a really great opportunity. I want to encourage folks here to learn more and talk to me about it. Another thing I just want to chime in is there has been a lot of discussion of expungement. Um, one of the reasons for that um, is because of the incredible collateral consequences people face in their daily lives when they have a felony conviction. Um, it reduces your ability to find housing, to get loans, business or educational. Um, it reduces your ability to um, get jobs and all kinds of things. Another reason is that Proposition 36 passed on the California ballot this last big election, um, which turned six different felonies into misdemeanors retroactively in California. And, and because it's retroactive, it can go back generations, <laughs> right, for folks who had these felonies. They can now change them to misdemeanors or petition for that and then get their records expunged. So it means that so many people who have had, for example, drug felonies on the record, which barred them from all kinds of benefits and housing, now have the opportunity to have a new lease on life, quite frankly. Um, and over 100,000 people in Alameda County and over 100,000 people in San Francisco County, if you go back retroactively, can qualify for relief under Prop 36. Um, so that's an area of, of incredible potential for, for people who might be interested in solo practices, whether it's working with veterans or not. So I just wanted to put that out there. What also I would add, it, and it ex you can only do this up to November 2017. Oh, yeah. it's Prop 47. Oh, Prop 47. Yeah. So you're right. Many numbers. Right. It's huge. You know, one of, the, one of the things I did when I first started working at the sheriff's office, I mean, actually, I was doing the barbary class here when they called me and said they were giving me a contract. It was like, why do the director job? And they're like, well, you're not even a lawyer yet, but we, we do like you, so we're going to give you a contract. And it was like 15 or $20 an hour, and it was something. But I started taking classes with the bar, at the bar association to do family law. I learned more about evictions. And I started getting bit. Part of that is to pay for those, you have to take, take cases. And when you take cases, that's how you learn. And you need other people there that actually pay you in, in the hallway. So it's a way to make a little extra money. They'll pay you in the hallway, but you can pick up clients. <laughs> it's five dollars out of my case. Um, so it's just going out and getting all the different types of experience. If you're going to do something in public interest, having all that experience is going to help you. Because veterans, especially, like they said, they have all the issues that you'll learn from. Yeah, I just I was just gonna touch on something you, you touched about earlier. Um, 
that um, you know doing this kind of work or working you know for example as an intern in sorts of classrooms you're doing sort of a very specific area of law VA benefits um, or discharge upgrades and I just wanted to emphasize that doing this kind of work doing records reviews writing advocacy briefs doing research um, those are transferable skills to all areas of law um, and certainly other areas of administrative law if you were interested in social security you know benefits or something like that it's a very similar sort of practice area um, but you know just there are general skills that you would learn as an attorney um, doing this sort of, sort of law that you could you know, then use in other areas. So, um, and it's also just, as everybody sort of says, it's just a very rewarding um, area to work in, and it's a great population, and uh, yeah, so that's my final thought. So I wanted to say thank you to the Veterans Association for organizing this panel, and thank you to all of our speakers for being here today.